this evening. We appreciate you coming out here this evening. Appreciate everybody going down to the Lord Church this morning, supporting their homecoming. And uh, it was a blessing. Uh, we enjoyed the the singing, and uh, and it was uh, it sure was a blessing uh, uh, this morning. So um, anybody got a word on your heart, a Bible verse, or anything this this evening? Anybody? Anybody got a Bible verse or a word on your heart? We appreciate everybody maybe watching online. We may have several tune in. We know there have been several uh, um, sick and things. We just be, be in prayer for one another. And let you know if you're watching online, we are praying for you. We love you. If there's anything we can do, we definitely uh, will we'll do it for you. Um, but this evening, uh, we're going to. Anybody got a Bible verse? We do thank the Lord uh, for those of you that helped out with our uh, yard sale again. It was a, a blessing to just come out and fellowship, if nothing else. We appreciate that. Uh, again, uh, maybe if you're watching online or anything, if anybody wants to donate to the yard sale and, and wants to, to give, we are going to try to do it again in October. So you just leave it here at the porch of the church. We'll make sure that it, it does get to the back. And, and uh, it really everything just goes to mission, so we do appreciate that. Look, I know I've got some more things I can add, and we pray, and let's just pray for it. Pray the Lord helps us and sends people our way, good weather our way, uh, definitely that day. This evening, I want to share a thought with you, and we have started a series, uh, it's really a couple months back, and uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, 1 Thessalonians and chapter number 4. We started a series some time ago, and I thought it was going to be something that I could do um, really maybe one Sunday a month, uh, and the Lord just hadn't brought us back to it, but he's been burdening our heart with it again, and I want to try to uh, finish this series over the next few Sunday nights, hopefully. We looked at the family matters. If you remember a while back, we looked at how much family does matter to us, and the key text that, that we looked at a few few uh, weeks back was in Joshua 24, 15. And, and, and it says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we said, really, the most precious thing the Lord has given us is he's given us our family. He, the most precious thing that all of us have is we have our family. And family is just so important in this day that we live. But 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 is where we'll be this evening We'll also be going to another text in, in a moment. But 1 Thessalonians 4, and uh, we'll start reading in verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 1. Uh, one Bible I have says this is a life pleasing to God. This Bible I'm preaching out of here says the believer's life. And, and really this will tell us a lot about our life. And, and if our family matters, uh, how we live our life matters. But verse number one says this, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye have received us of how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Sounds to me like uh, once we figure out how to walk and we figure out what we ought to do, we're going to grow in the Lord more and more. But verse number two says, For you know, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of covetousness, but even the Gentiles, which know not of God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is, is the avenger of such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanliness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not no man, but God who hath given us his Holy Spirit. 
But as touching brotherly love, ye, ye need not that I write unto you, for yourselves you are taught of God to love one another. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we certainly need you here this evening, Lord. Uh, we've, you've given us a thought, and we just want to be obedient to you and come back to this family series, Lord. And we know how important our family is. But Lord, before we can ever touch our homes, before we ever can make a difference in our homes and in our households and with our family, uh, the lives that we live truly do matter. The way that we live matters. Our relationship with you matters. And until we get that straight, Lord, we're, we're, our homes will be a mess. And Lord, where our prayer is this evening, Lord, if there's anybody other than you on the throne of our life, that, that we get that straightened out here this evening. And maybe sitting and watching at home at online, maybe our hearts get nudged, our hearts get pricked, and we realize even at home that we need you. We need you. And, and you've got to be on the throne of our life, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we looked at this a few months back and just how family matters. And I'll tell you the most precious thing that we have is our family. And it's up to us. It ain't up to nobody else, but it's up to me. And it's up to you just to decide that I'm going to make God a priority. And family is going to matter. And, and, and just like Joshua, and I wonder how many of us even just have that in our homes. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have that uh, on display in one or two, one or more manners in our home. And how important it is to know that we will serve the Lord. And I'll tell you, uh, we looked at just kind of an introduction a while back, but to really our homes and for our families to matter, the number one thing that, that's going to have to get uh, situated is ourselves. It starts with us. And, and in, in the emphasis of that opening text in Joshua a few weeks back, but as for me, Joshua said, as for me. In other words, it's going to start with me. Being the man of the home, it's going to start with me. Or it's going to start with you. It's not going to start with my neighbor. I'm not going to keep blaming mom and daddy, grandma and grandpa for something. I'm just going to say, as for me and my house, I'm just going to serve the Lord. And I believe Joshua is an example to the people during that day. And we're going to see toward the end that, yes, he might have been an example. But, but I'll tell you, uh, it's going to have to be a decision on our part, not his part. In other words, I'm not doing it because of the pastor. Or I'm not doing it just because of the altar call. Or I'm not doing it just because it may look good to come to the altar. I'm doing it because I know that my home matters. I know that family matters. And I know that my relationship with him matters. Matters, And I'm telling you, it all starts in our homes. That's the closest thing, one of the most important things that God has given us. He's given us our homes. And if you and I don't care about our homes, I see cars going up and down the road right now as I preach. They don't care about your home. They don't care about you. They don't care about the church or they'd be, in their, they'd be here this evening. They don't care. And I'll tell you, if you don't care about your homes, there ain't nobody going to care. And if you and I don't care, uh, again, nobody is going to care. It's going to have to start with us. But family matters, and, and, and that's why we're doing this series. But tonight I want to look at family matters, but I want to look at how it matters, and it matters to us personally. It matters to yourself. You put your name in there, and it matters to yourself. Look at verse number 1 in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 1, it says, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by Lord Jesus, that as you have received us, how you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. I mean, how we walk is important, is what verse number 1 says. And that walk is a personal walk. In other words, I can't walk for Gary, and I can't walk for Glenda. I've got to walk for me. My personal walk is important. In other words, I want to walk for Harper. She's going to come to church. Church is going to be a priority. I'm going to make her come. She's not going to decide that she wants to stay home. I'm the adult. I'm the, the, the head of the household. And if, if and God help us if the kids are going to tell us if they come or don't come. Uh, she's going to come. But I can't, my, I can't do her personal walk for her. I cannot walk for her. I can't walk for you and you can't walk for me. And I read here in this text that Ye ought to walk and to please God. It's you ought to walk. That's you and that's I. And we ought to walk. And as we walk, it ought to be pleasing to God. Well, preacher, uh, what's pleasing about our walk? Preacher, what makes it pleasing? 
I mean, I've accepted the blood. He sees the blood, and that's all that matters. He, his, his blood is, uh, we've accepted it, and he sees the blood. He doesn't see our failures. That's very true. But our walk matters, too, because he says there in verse number one, how you ought to walk and to please God. We ought to walk and we ought to please God. Verse number two, it says, for you know, uh, you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, yes, you're going to have to walk. And as you walk, you know the commandments as you walk. They were at the hospital yesterday and they said, hey, Bill, you've got to walk. You've got to move. You've got to do things. And as I read this text, it says you ought to walk. What happens if we get sick and we just lay? It gets built up in the stomach. What happens if we don't walk? There's people going to die. There's this lost and dying world that's not going to know Jesus if we don't walk and if we don't move. And in verse number one, he says, how you ought to walk and you ought to please God. But then the next verse says, you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you don't have to figure out everything. It's done printed in this Bible. He's done given to us in his word. And he tells us in Matthew 22 and 36, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? They did not ask this question. And in verse number two, he says, for what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus? Jesus gave us commandments. And in Matthew 22, 36, he says, what is that great commandment? What should we be doing? If I'm going to walk, what should I be doing? Well, in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. The very first thing that we ought to do in our walk is we ought to please God. Walk pleasing to him. Everything about us ought to please God. And not only that, in verse number 38, in Matthew 22, 38, it says, this is the first and great commandment. In other words, we've got to love God. I mean, we've got to be saved. We've got to be born again and then love Him. But then our walk later on here is going to be demonstrated. It's going to be shown off by Matthew 30 and Matthew 22, 39. The second is likened to it. Thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. What pleases God is number one, loving God. But then if you love God, the second thing we ought to do is love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Love others, care for others, have compassion for others. In other words, don't make it all about us, but love other people. And God tells us that's, that's how it ought to be. And here's the thing, I'm never going to love others if I don't love myself. I'm never going to love Harper, never going to love Ashley the way I ought to love her if I don't love myself and if you don't love yourself. Well, how are you going to demonstrate your love for yourself? Well, how we live and how we uh, walk according to the things of God. In other words, if I just live how I want and live a life of, uh, of unholiness and uncleanliness, I'm not loving myself. And when I don't love myself, I'm not going to be able to love others. Because, number one, I'm not loving myself and I'm not loving Christ. How am I going to love others if I don't love Christ? The first commandment is to love God and to keep his commandments. But then, if we don't love God, we can't love other people. And then how in the world am I going to have love in my home? How am I going to lead in my home? How am I going to be the person I ought to be in my home if I don't love myself? And you don't love yourself. And if we really love ourselves, we put God first in everything that we do. It's not a worldly love. And, and I'll tell you, no preacher preaches on, hey, you need to love yourself. Because everybody loves themselves. Everybody lives for themselves. Everybody does for themselves. But this is not a worldly love for yourself. It's not about gain. It's not about world, wealth and fame and fortune and worldly gain and treasures of this life. It's about being set apart. It's, being, it's about loving God. And, and, and that's that's showing our love towards him. And that's when family's really going to matter. Family's going to matter when I love myself. And family's going to matter when I love myself. And then we start loving others God's way. Let's continue in this text. And we're going to see that God's way is different than the world's ways. In verse number three, it says, for this is the will of God. All right? Back to verse number one. You ought to walk and you ought to please God. Number two, in verse 2, know the commandments. Then in verse 3, that's the will of God. 
even your sanctification that you abstain from fornication. Sanctification, that's a big word, but all it means is we ought to be purified. We ought to be holy. In other words, we ought to be set apart. There ought to be something different about God's people. I mean, he knows us. He knows us so well. He knows us so well that he knows what a lot of our problems are sometimes. It says abstain from fornication. We can put any sin there, but I'm telling you, he knows uh, our desires. He knows our cravings. He knows uh, our, our failures. He formed us from the dust of the ground. There ain't no use for us to sugarcoat it. That's the thing that, that we can outsmart God, and he don't know uh, what sets, uh, sets us back, and he don't know our failures, but he knows us. He's our creator. He's our maker. He, he's our possessor. He knows everything about us, and we're his. Then I read here, verse number four, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. How important is that verse number four? That every one of us should know how to possess, possess his vessel. In other words, we ought to know how to live. We ought to know how to possess this vessel that God's given us. This is our, our vessel. This is our bodies, and it's God's. It's his. And we ought to know because we're his. In other words, you ought to know how to live. We ought to know how to act because we're his anyway. His spirit's living on the inside. The body's his, and if, if we're saved believers, in verse number four, it says you should know how to possess his vessel. Look at that. That's his vessel. You don't say you have to possess your vessel. He says we got to know how to possess your own, his vessel, because it's not even your own anyway. <laughs> I tell you, it goes back to 1 Corinthians 6, and in 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, it says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. In other words, we're saved, we're of one spirit. The spirit in mine is the same spirit in him. We're one. We're joined together. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, the next verse says, flee fornication again. But then it says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication is sin against his own body. What? Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you, you have of God, and you're not your own. In other words, we're his. We're bought with a price. We're not even our own to act how we want and do how we want. We're his. So often, you may say, what are you saying, preacher? All I'm saying is so often we want to live how we want and do how we want, but then somehow make our family matter. Our family's not going to matter if God's not mattering. If I'm doing how I want and living how I want, God's not mattering, and how's my family going to matter? It's not. God set guidelines. He set boundaries. And he says that you're his and you're bought with a price. And therefore, in our text, it says uh, how to possess his vessels in sanctification and, uh, and honor. In verse number five, again, we see the, the same link to fornication. We didn't see the same link to living a life that's, that's unholy. We're never going to be able to help others. We're never going to be able to uh, support those in our home if we're not living right and we're not living holy. And we're not putting God first. In verse number six, it says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner. In other words, we ought to put others first. We shouldn't defraud others. In other words, uh, we're bought with the blood of Jesus. We're of his spirit. We are his since the Lord is the avenger of such. In other words, have a good relationship with others. How we live is so vital and so important. We're created beings, but hey, you're bought with a price. You're bought with his blood. There's something important. There's something special about you. You're not your own to do and live how you want anyway. And in verse number seven, look what it says. It says, for God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but to holiness. Again, he says, hey, you can't go wallow with the pigs. You can't go out and get in the mud and you're going to get dirty. He says, I've called you to holiness. I've called you to something separate. The word holiness there in that text, it shows, it, it, it relates to the fact that we are bought with a prize. There's something different about us. There's something special about God's people. 
It sounds a lot like in this verse, it goes back to verse number 3 and verse number 4 that, that this uncleanliness, it ought not to be in our life. It ought to lead to holiness. And in the next verse, in verse number 8, it says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath given us his Holy Spirit. In other words, if we're living a life that's a mess, it isn't your brother and sister that you hate. It isn't your family that you're forsaken. You're going against God. That's not me speaking. That's what the Bible says. He says in verse number 8, he says, He therefore that despises, despises not man but God. In other words, you're not, you're not, you're hurting your brother. You're hurting that wife. You're hurting that child. You're hurting that grand young man. My, my, but in the whole process, you're hurting God in the process. Verse number 9 says, but, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you for yourselves, you're, you're taught of God to love one another. Again, we read here that we're given His Spirit. We, his Spirit bears with our spirit. We should love one another as Christ loved one another. It's not complicated. All He wants us to do is He wants us to love. But you can't never love if we're a mess. And we know that we're all messes, but we've got to have Jesus. To summarize what we've just read here in this text in 1 Thessalonians 4, I read there in verse number 1, he says, you ought to walk and you ought to please God. We ought to keep going, but as we walk, people are looking at us and we ought to please God. And then in verse number 2, uh, he gives us his commandments, and the greatest commandment is all us to love God, but then love others. Then I see a problem taking place in this text. Verses 3, verses uh, 5, verses 7, verses 8. All of them talk about uncleanliness, fornication, uh, unholiness, and things that get in the way of us being the believer that we ought to be, being the Christian that we ought to be. Therefore, that precious vessel that, that Christ knit, that's mentioned in the Bible that precious vessel that's bought with the blood of Jesus or not, that ought to be devoted to him is devoted to ourselves, living to our own pleasures than to live for God. But I'm looking at the family matters. I'm looking at why the family matters. I'm looking at how you play a part in the family. In other words, if we tie all this to the family matters series, how we live is important. I can't live how I want, do how I want, and act how I want, and, and, and please God. But if I don't please God, there's no way I'm going to be able to love others like I ought to love them. I just wonder how many years and how many times in our life have we been caught up with ourselves and we're unable to love that our family, those within our homes, or those, uh, those, that, are, uh, those that God placed in our life, maybe even down at the workplace, our work family, because our own lives are a mess. Think about it a minute. If our own lives are a mess, we're never going to be able to help. We're never going to be able to do well, help for others. We see all this sickness. We see all this stuff going on in this world that we live. And again, the, the service here before we went live, I said, that man, if there's ever been a time to reach out for, to other people, to love on other people, it's right now, this second, and this hour. But here's the thing. If I've got a mess in my life, and I'm more concerned with myself, and I know my own life's a mess. I'm not going to care about nobody else. I've got my own problems to worry about. But see, Joshua got to this point in, in, in Joshua's life. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The family and how the family operates, it all starts with the person sitting in the pew this evening. It all starts with us. You may say, well, I'm not the head of the home. Yeah, but it, it, you play a part. We're all a part. And how the family operates starts with you. And I got one question, and we're done this evening. You usually have multiple points, but I have one point, and this is it. I want to ask you this. It's related to what we've heard in 1 Thessalonians 4. We can either focus on God, or we can live in uncleanliness. We can fulfill our own lusts, our own desires, or love others. But it starts with loving God and then loving others. 
But if I don't love God, I'm never going to love others the way it should, the way I should. But who is your king? Who is on the throne of your life right now? In other words, Joshua made this statement. He says, I don't care who you are. I don't care uh, who it is. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. That's in Joshua 24. That's in Joshua 24. And I want you to turn to the book of Judges for just a minute. I told you it was going to be in another text. But go to the book of Judges. So Joshua makes this statement. Joshua 24 in verse number 15. It's ending the end of Joshua's life. And he says, uh, and I'm just going to read that whole verse while you're finding your place in Judges 2. It says, and, and if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day. In other words, make this decision right now. Who are you going to serve? It says, whether it be the gods which your father, which gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want you to choose. I want you to make a decision. Who's gonna, who's, who are you going to serve? So who is your king? Well, Joshua's king was, was Jesus. He says, the Lord's going to be the king of my life. It's not up to me to live in sin. I'm just going to, for me and my house, I can't, I can't uh, account for the house up down the street, but as for me and my house. But here's the thing. You get to the book of Judges, and in Judges 2, We'll start reading at verse number 6, and look what it says. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. So we see here they started dividing the land, and, and, and Joshua then made that decision. He said, you better make a decision. You better decide who you're going to follow. It's almost like you're coming here to church. We make this decision. We're going to go to our separate lands. And he says, hey, when you go to your separate lands, what are you going to do? Verse number 7, look what it says. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that, that outlived Joshua, whom had seen the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. There came a time when Joshua, there came a time when all those elders that made a stand, when all those elders that stood the test of time, there come a time where they died. They moved on. In other words, they had a king that God, they were going to serve God. They all made an agreement. I don't care what's happening on Sunday. I'm going to, I'm going to serve God. I don't care what's coming. I'm going to limp to the house of God. I'm just going to serve. I don't care what my bank account says. I'm going to serve God. I don't care what kind of illness God throws my way. I'm just going to serve God. And there was these, these, these elders. There was these, this older generation. There was Joshua, that next generation. But it was time for another generation to step up. For us, we might have been raised in a good Christian home. For us, we might have had good grandparents. For us, we might have been raised in a good community that, that, that believed in the things of God. But here's the thing. Sooner or later, that next generation is going to move on. In other words, there's sooner or later that pastor that led you to the Lord, they're going to move on. Sooner or later, that grandma that took you to church, they're going to move on. And sooner or later, it's going to be up to you. And you are the generation that's going to have to make the decision. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, why did I in the world did I go to 1 Thessalonians 4? Because we dabble in sin. We live in uncleanliness. We live in filth. God's told us how to live. He said, love me, love your neighbors. It's simple. Do those things and everything's going to be hunky dory. It's all going to be fine. It's so simple. But what happens is the next generation comes about. They ought to have a king. They, ought, they know how to live. They've had another generation tell them. But now it's their time. Preaching on family matters as well. And I'll tell you, our family members matter. And I'll tell you, uh, we've got enough family members that if we looked around, I'm just telling you right now, if I was to reach all my family members, even the ones that's church and unchurched, my, my people that I work with, people that you know, we could fill this church up double if we could get a hold of all of them. It's just time for us to get a hold of people. It's time for us to get real with people. But what keeps us from it? It's the uncleanness is First Thessalonians 4. It's us, brother, please ourselves and help others. 
next for us, or rather uh, just, just live for ourselves than to live for others. In other words, there was another generation. I know. I know it didn't, that other generation didn't enjoy uh, some of the things that they did, but they did hard work and they didn't, they didn't complain about it. They didn't care about it. Let's think about all the homecomings as we went down there and ate homecoming. That was hard on that older generation. It was. And homecomings and all the cooking. But you never heard them complain. Never. Never would they have said, uh, my gosh, this is a lot of work. This is awful. Never. They looked for the day. It was like Super Bowl Sunday. They loved it. There was just something different about that other generation that we don't have in this generation. I'm just saying. But if another generation does not step up and would rather complain and rather fulfill the lust of the flesh, and I'm not saying anybody's out, uh, out shacking up and things. I don't know. We all got sins and things. All I'm saying is if we know to do good, we don't do it. It's a we know we've got brothers and sisters in the church and they're hurting and they're aching and they're hurting financially and the church can't help. We, we got a mess. We're loving ourselves and loving our own pocketbooks, loving our own time, loving our own uh, hobbies more than God. And that's a, that's, a, that's a scary thing because Joshua said, if ask for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But then there got to a point those elders, those older people, the older, out, those elders that outlived Joshua in verse 7, they died. Joshua died. But then look at verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord. Here comes another generation that saw mom and daddy, grandma and grandpa, Dabble in sin and, and in other words love themselves more than God and they, 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 they don't know that as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord and now here comes the other generation and they don't know the Lord which knew not the Lord forget the works he had done for Israel they don't know the Lord but they also don't know how good God's been Verse number 11, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Baal. And they forsook the Lord God and their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed their other gods and gods of the people, which round about them and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Look at that. An entire generation. Based on one decision, another decision, another home, another individual, then another home, then another family, then another community. And then all of a sudden, we've got a whole generation that's no longer for God. They're no longer for Him. How did it start? It started with one. It started with yourself. One person had to make a decision within that home. God wasn't important. In other words, I made one decision that playing on the phone and entertaining was more important than just talking about the things of God. And then sooner or later, the next generation comes, the next generation rises up, and they don't know the Lord. They know not the Lord. They don't know the Lord, and they end up forsaking the Lord. When it's their time, they say, I don't know nothing about this God. I don't know nothing about him because they was never told. They forsook the Lord, and what did they serve? Well, it says they served Balaam there in verse number 11. In verse number 13, it says they served Baal and Ashtoreth. But here's the thing. They served, you fill in the blank. Of course, serving all kinds of things and living for all kinds of things in this day that we live. But they got to the point where they just forsook the Lord and put everything else before him. How does that affect your family? How does that tie into family matters? Well, if you don't matter, and if you want to do how you want, the people in your home is going to do how they want. And when they start doing how they want, you're going to, we're going to end up losing a family. We lose a family, we lose a community. We lose a, a community, we lose a city. We lose a city, we end up losing a whole generation. And that's where I believe we're at in 2022. You may say, well, they forsook other lords. But what happened? Well, they did forsake the Lord. And some of the saddest verses, I want to come back to this next Sunday night, and I appreciate the Lord giving us some, 
some thoughts, but also uh, giving us some direction for the next uh, Sunday night. The next Sunday night in, in Judges 17 and verse number 6, it says, And in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did bid that which was right in his own eyes. In Judges 18 and verse number 1, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought, sought them in inheritance to dwell in, for they for unto the day that an inheritance had not fallen unto them to the tribes of Israel. In 19.1 it says, And it came to pass, and in those days there was no king in Israel. In Judges 21 and verse number 25, it says again, verse of Judges 21, verse number 25, it says, And in those days there was, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right, in his own eyes. What a way to end the book. The book of Judges. Judges 21, 25. There was no king. There was no king in Israel. And they just, they did that which was right in their own eyes. No king, no authority. Do how you want. Live how you want. Act how you want. As long as you just sing kumbaya, hold hands, and go to hell together. If that isn't the world that we live, that's the world we live. What happened then, preacher? It goes back to family matters. It goes back to yourself and how you matter in your home. It matters how you affect the home. And Joshua made that decision. But I, I'm afraid too many folks has made a decision based on Mama or daddy or grandma or grandpa, and they did never really, they had a head knowledge of God, but they never had a heart knowledge. They never knew a, a true relationship with Christ. And what happens is an entire generation is now, they don't know God. They've left God. As we look around, I don't, there's a generation that's not in this church building right now. And then we see another generation that's not in the church building under that generation. And if things don't change about another generation after that, if we continue to the point where in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes, if we continue down that path, another generation, where will we be? I'm not preaching to be ugly. I'm not preaching to be mean. I'm not preaching uh, um, something that we can't do. But here's what we can do is we leave and we part our ways and we go our separate ways. Make an impact in the home that you live, the family that you live, the grand youngest that you've got, in the community and at the workplace. Family matters and it starts with ourselves. It starts with you. And I'm telling you, if we, if we don't get real and we don't play games and we continue to play games, my, my, my. It starts from the top and works its way down. There ain't no problem up there. There's nothing wrong in heaven. There's nothing wrong with God. We've messed up. We've messed up. Wouldn't it be awful? We get to the point where, God, I wish I'd done this. God, I messed up. 150 some years in the church. It's got to close their doors because I'd rather do how I want, live how I want, act how I want than to just love God and love others. That's all I had to do. That's all it took. But it starts with us. It's a hard message. seriousness to this message. I believe I believe this could be the final warning in a message like this. If, if we continue to play games I don't know what else we can do. If we continue to live in sin knowing knowing good and well what an impact you have in the home to those grandkids and kids and spouse if we continue to forsake our family knowing that you matter, but it starts with God, and it starts with loving others, 
I don't know we may get to the point where we don't have another opportunity. But I, my prayer is this. That we have some Christians here tonight, here in our church, but even listening online, that does like Joshua and says, hey, but as for me and my house, I don't care what everybody else does, but I know that my family is my responsibility, and I know that the home starts with me, and it starts with myself, but as for me and my house, we're just going to serve the Lord. He didn't ask for me in my house, we're going to get a little bit of God on Sunday. No. Ask for me in my house all throughout the week, all the way that we come back to church on Sunday. I'm going to serve the Lord. In my mouth, in my words, I'm going to serve the Lord. In the music I listen to in the car, I'm serving the Lord. In what I watch on TV, I'm serving the Lord. Everything that I do, I want to be honoring and pleasing to Him. Why? Because His Spirit's in me if I'm saved. And, and, and His Spirit bears with my spirit. And I'm not going against that. I start going against that, I'm going to start living for myself and lose my family and lose a generation. The question is this evening, who is your king? Who's on the throne of your life? And who are you living for? Your Heavenly Father. Lord, forgive us for where we failed you. Forgive us. I know in my own life there's been times I've lived for myself. I've done for myself. And Lord, there is no excuse, as you showed me back in school. There is no excuse. There's no buts. There's no wringling our way out of it. And here's why there's no excuse. Lord, you, we know that you came to this earth. We know that you lived. We know that you lived and sacrificed for others. We know that you came and you died on that cross given us no excuse. There is no excuse to get us out of it. But not only that, you give us your word. And as we've seen in your word here this evening, how important it is to just live holy and live for you. Our walk is important. Our day-to-day -day life is important. Loving you is important. Loving that others is important. But I'm telling you, I can't love others if myself is a mess. And if myself ain't in, on par with you, if my spirit's not lining up with you, I'm going to forsake others all day long. And we're going to end up losing another generation. Lord, you're tarrying. Lord, you're waiting. And Lord, there's hope. As long as you're available, as long as you're present, there's hope. And Lord, we're just going to have to draw to you. Lord, we're just going to have to humble ourselves to you. Lord, we're going to have to quit making everything else a priority over church and over you. You are the most important thing that there is. Lord, help us. Help us. There is no excuse. There's no excuse, Lord. Lord, as I look to my home, please, Lord, let me be the husband that I need to be and the dad that I need to be. Lord, at the workplace, let me be the Christian that I need to be. Lord, here at Roaring Creek, let me be the pastor that I need to be. I know I come short. I know there's only so much time and hours in the day. But Lord, forgive us for where we failed you. But Lord, let us pattern our life after you. Let us live for you. And if we're pleasing to God, we start, we start loving God as, with all of our heart. We will love others. There's no way. If we don't love others, we don't love God. Lord, forgive us, every single one, under the sound of my voice, even online, forgive us for where we failed you. But let this moment, 9-11, be a day that goes down in history where we refocus and we repattern our life. And where family does matter, that's going to have to start with every single one of us. We've never outraised the kids. We're still a part of the family. Lord, you help us. Give us strength. Help us just be the Christians, be the lights that we need to be. Most of all, in our families, because home matters. The family matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.